Stay tuned for The Whitney Reynolds Show and see how change makes a difference. The Respiratory Health Association is a proud supporter of The Whitney Reynolds Show, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. We often hear, be the change you want to see. Sounds easy, but what if that change involves risk when it comes to health, money, and business? Today's guests are putting it all on the line. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. Jeremy Courtney is the co-founder and executive director of the Preemptive Love Coalition an international development organization based in Iraq that provides life-saving heart surgeries to Iraqi children and training for local doctors and nurses, creating peace in communities at odds. So we were saying in your intro about the Preemptive Love Coalition. Now it's based in Iraq. Tell us a little bit about how it got started. Well, my wife and I moved to Iraq almost eight years ago now to help with widows and orphans who were suffering from the last major round of violence during the last war. And I was sitting in a hotel, working on my laptop, minding my own business in the middle of that last war. And the chai guy who had been serving me tea in this hotel as I'd come and gone over the couple of months of working there, kind of got up the nerve this one day to ask me a question. And he said, you know, Jeremy, you've been coming here for a while. Do you think you could uh, help me if I asked you a favor? And I said, yeah, man, go ahead. And he went on to tell me about his cousin. He said, you know, I've got this cousin. He's a guy like us, 20 years old, something. And he's got this little girl who was about this big. She was born with this huge hole in her heart. And there's not a hospital or a doctor left in all of Iraq that can save her life. Is there something you could do to help? And so our family became really interested in trying to see what we could do to help this little girl. And we threw our weight behind this family to see what we could do to save her life. And one thing led to another. And we've ended up dedicating our life now as an organization and as a family to eradicating this backlog of tens of thousands of children across Iraq who are waiting in line for these life-saving heart surgeries. So is that a normal case? Is there a lot of children in need of heart surgery? Well, when we first met this one little girl, you know, we just thought it was one family and, uh, you know, kind of a special situation. But when we took her file and began knocking around on doors and trying to see what we could do to help her, uh, we became aware of hundreds of kids in our city alone, hundreds who were waiting in line for these life-saving heart surgeries. And then the more we broadened our search, the more we started helping children one at a time, the more children started coming out of the woodworks and knocking on our doors and calling me on my private cell phone. And you know, word was spreading that there was suddenly hope for these families in the middle of this war. And yeah, before long, they just were piled up on us. And so it is a very normal thing, sadly. So you say you went during the first war. What, what was that timing? About 2006 is when we started our time in Iraq. Was that a, very, a really dangerous time for you to kind of uproot your family from the States and go over there? Well, we were already living in the region, so we were nearby. We were a little more proximate and aware of some of the violence and aware of some of the stories, both on the you know, sensational side and the, the non-sensational side. The war is not always strictly what we see on headline news. And so there's, there's always another side. There's always pockets of peace and things like this. So. We ended up moving to a city that was relatively peaceful, relatively calm, and working out of that city into much more violent places. People that have a vision sometimes develop that vision either from a life experience or you know they have a direct impact, like someone in their family had a problem that really impacted them. Where did this vision come from? Because I mean, most people, they graduate college, you start a family, you have two kids, they don't say, let's move to Iraq. Where'd you get that from? Well, I think, you know, it was, it's just kind of a one step at a time thing. We, we moved to the region, the general region after 9-11. Um, we were affected, like everyone in America, by the realities of 9-11. Uh, but rather than reacting primarily from a posture of fear and um, somehow joining the many, many others across the country that responded negatively toward Muslims and engaged in racial profiling and things like that, we just felt compelled to, to respond differently. We wanted to be a part of the solution and not part of the fear-mongering problem. And so, so we were already in the neighborhood when the Iraq war really got to its, its peak violence. And that made it easier, I think, to step from 
a, a, a nearby country with nearby problems and walk into Iraq. It wasn't like we were coming from small town Texas straight over to Iraq. Right, and so at this point, these people have become your neighbors. Yeah. That you've learned so much about the culture, and what did you learn about the culture that maybe we might not know? Oh goodness, I mean, I, you know, the, the probably most profound thing that we've learned is also the most simplest and the most obvious, and that is that they really are people just like us. I mean, that, that is so simple, but when you sit with a dad, so when this Chai guy introduced me to his cousin, and cousin came to the hotel a couple days later, when cousin walked through those double doors at the hotel by his side, best decision he ever made in his life was his little six-year-old girl. And before dad made it to my table where I was sitting waiting for him, I was a goner. You know, I knew I was going to help this dad. I knew I was going to help this family before they ever made it to my table. And when he sat his little six-year-old girl there in front of me, she started coloring on a napkin. And we connected, not as Muslim and Christian, but as fathers. You know, we, we connected as men who love their children. And it was so easy to relate to him in that moment. If I was in that situation in the middle of war with no options, my first thought was, is there anything I wouldn't do to help my daughter? Are there any number of street corners I wouldn't stand on and beg? Are there any number of doors I wouldn't knock on? Is there anything I wouldn't do to help my little girl? And once I felt that and experienced that with him, it made it so easy to respond and join him. So how did you help him? Did you have connections to doctors? Did you have financial resources that could help bump his daughter up? How did that happen? Well, the, the non-heroic part of the story is that my first response to Chai Guy and this father was, I can't do it. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm probably gonna fail you. I don't have any resources. This is out of my league. That was actually my first response. He helped me get over that. He helped me kind of take courage and take heart. And he helped me see that if you fail us, we lose nothing, really. But if you succeed for us, you know, it could be an absolute game changer for our family. And so they kind of coached me and coaxed me into helping. And uh, I got up the courage to make a few phone calls is really all it boiled down to. I knew I was going to fail them. I knew I didn't know anyone who could help with this situation. And to my great surprise, my second phone call I found this friend who basically said, oh yeah, I know everything about that. Just bring the file over, I'll make it happen. And that kind of snowballed. One thing led to another, led to another, and you know things have grown from how there. Many, how many children have you helped? Well, last week we just helped our 1,000th child. We just performed our 1,000th heart surgery. That is so awesome. I mean, that is amazing what you're doing. So, and then you just, you said something very amazing earlier. You said, you can't let fear creep in. Is that what you would say to our viewers at home that maybe want to see change, be the change? Is it something that like you got to just listen with your heart? You know, I mean, fear. Sometimes fear gets a bad rap, right? I mean, there there are some good things about fear. When I'm when I'm standing at the edge of uh, you know a cliff and wondering if I should take a few steps closer, fear says, "Beware! There's there's actually real danger here." But other times, it's good to just turn to fear and say, thank you very much. Thank you for voicing your opinion. I've heard you. Now sit down and shut up because there's something to be done here. And I think that, you know, I think we tend to know, we feel in our hearts when those moments are. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Anything you want to leave our viewers at home with? Well, I think that I, I would want people to know that for all that Iraq and the people of Iraq and the children of Iraq have been in the news in recent months, the, the news is not set up to give us all the information that I would so much love for the people of America and the world to know about the people of Iraq. You know, the, if, you, if you only get your information about Iraq from the news, you'd be inclined to think that Iraq is done for, that it's, it's falling apart and there's no hope for Iraq. And that's just not the Iraq I know. No, those aren't the families I know. And so I would just urge people to, to seek out as much information as possible as they can. Um, find us on our website where we share broad stories about the people of Iraq and everything that they're going through and experiencing and encourage people to just keep hope, keep faith, keep investing in the people of Iraq and the Middle East because at the end of the day, they're moms and dads and children just like us. Thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me. It's now time for our social sizzle and today we have Lauren Paul, Aaron Paul's wife from the hit series Breaking Bad and her business partner Molly Thompson to discuss how they are trying to change culture through the KIND campaign. Hi, 
I'm Lauren Parsikian. I'm Molly Thompson. And we are the co-founders of Kind Campaign and the filmmakers of the documentary Finding Kind. The two of us founded Kind Campaign back in 2009, and really the passion for this project came from not only our own personal experiences with what we call girl against girl crime, but growing up in a society where it seems like every girl experiences this sense of gossip and competition and rumors and manipulation between their female friendships and just wanting to understand why that is our universal experience and how we can change it. Within Kind Campaign is our documentary and our assembly program and various curriculum and materials that we have developed to start important conversations and to open girls up just to talk about how hard it can be for a girl and really just to figure out how we can get to the root of the problem and start healthy relationships between females. And so we, for the last four years, have traveled across America and Canada and have spoken in hundreds of schools and have screened Finding Kind in thousands of venues and have seen this as something that has changed girls' lives. And it has started vital conversations and transformed friendships right before our eyes. So just to step into a new chapter of Kind Campaign and to kind of take everything we've done and bring it into a new chapter, um, we've come up with a really cool concept and we're going to share that with you today. So right now we are working on creating what we are calling a kind kit and what we're doing is putting our assembly program, so what we do when we are in schools talking to girls, putting that onto DVD and pairing that with our film Finding Kind and our club curriculum that is already implemented in schools all across the country and putting all of that together and creating a kind kit. And what we're hoping to do with these kits is for them to spread the message of kindness in schools all over the country and schools can take this kind kit and take the curriculum within the kit and implement the program within their schools and host assemblies without us actually having to be there because already when we were traveling before we can only be in one place at one time and we really want this message to spread in every single school across America. Well our next two guests are involved in your not so typical school fundraiser. John Gorleski and Elizabeth Terman join us now. Welcome. Thank you for having us. So you go to Highland Park High School. Yes. And you are the advisor for this fundraiser. Tell us a little bit about this year of giving back. Well, it's something we've been doing now for 21 years. This is our 21st year. Um, we started in 94 with the idea of let's do a fundraiser, like a lot of clubs, organizations do at a high school level. And so it started with your typical bake sales and um, you know, walking around with envelopes and taking donations and things like that. And we raised $3,700 for the Howard Brown Clinic, which is a clinic for HIV infected people in the city. And uh, we thought the next year, that was pretty good. Let's do it again and let's see if we can get a few more people involved. And that's how it all started. And so now it has evolved to now not just Student Senate, which we're on the sponsor of and Elizabeth is a member of, but to a total school project across the board, faculty, staff, athletic teams, organizations, um, everybody in school is involved, which makes it unique. That is so cool. The first year, the one you were saying, kind of the envelope, bake, sell, those are your normal ones. Mm -hmm. And that usually helps with like homecoming parades and whatnot, but you guys are actually saying, we're gonna put this towards one nonprofit. Right, that's something that, that makes it unique. There's, there's so many worthy projects out there but what we like about this is that it gives the entire school community a chance to pull together for one cause. Um, I, I think at Highland Park Heights we do a lot of great things, but we pull in a thousand different directions. Um, but for one month, it's one direction and all of us together. So as a freshman, you're a senior now. Yes. But as a freshman, did you come in kind of like experiencing the first year of it and say, okay, I want to be involved? Or is it something that you knew about right off the bat? Like, has it grown with you as you've gone through high school? It has definitely grown with me. I have an older sister who always told me about how great Charity was, Charity Drive was. So I knew right from the start that it was something I wanted to be involved in. But after experiencing it for the first time as my freshman year, I said, this is definitely something that I want to be even more a part of and get on the leadership side of it instead of just the bake sales and the participating and going to events. I knew I wanted to be involved in planning them. So how does the process work whenever you, because like you said, there's a million great causes, but how do you decide just one? Well, we have a set of criteria that we look at for our selection. We try to choose a small to medium charity so we know that our money would have an impact. Uh, we try to make it local in nature to some degree. Uh, we'd like it to be child-centered. 
and we look for charities that um, can kind of help us in some way with um, communication about the charity, information about it. Maybe they have connections, connections on the North Shore or Chicagoland area for prizes for our silent auction or whatever it may be, because uh, you know, our goal is twofold, to raise money for the charity, but also to spread awareness, and so that's an important part for us. Wow, now what area do you serve in? I am the, one of the heads of Charities Drive, so there are three of us, and we are involved in picking the charities that will be, we make a ballot. So there's three charities that go on a ballot, and the entire school, faculty, staff, students, everyone can vote. So we are involved in picking those three charities, and then when the month comes around and Charity Drive is here, we are involved in overseeing all of the events. We plan some events ourselves and just making sure that everything is running smoothly. Does every student at Highland Park High School get involved? I think that yes, I can say that every student is involved in some way, whether it's buying a donut in the hall that the math teachers are selling or going to ch um, a silent auction event or running in, we have a 24 hour run. There's so many different things to be involved in that I think just about every student is involved. So you almost walk through high school learning not all these different things that it can teach you, but the main component is the charity aspect, giving back. Yes, that's definitely something that as a school, we are very big about promoting. And I think that this month of Charity Drive does a great job of showing just how important that is and how powerful it can be when an entire school unites for one cause. What's the goal? What is the number? Are we talking about $5,000? I don't think so. Well, to be honest with you, Whitney, we don't, we don't set a goal. We don't talk about the money. The total is kept secret the entire month, and there's only... There are only two people who know the total before we have a closing assembly. And so the highlight of the closing assembly is when the final number is revealed. And it's a, we do some fun way of doing it and the, the crowd is excited and that's, that's really a, a highlight. So it's, as we say it, it's not about the money. And so it doesn't matter if kids want to do a fundraising event and raise 20 bucks or if they want to do something and raise $2,000. It's the fact that everybody's involved which makes it so cool. So let's talk about the money, though. I know it's not about the money, but let's get down to the last year's number. <laughs> it's not about the money, but yeah. Um, well, last year's number was $165,000, and it benefited the uh, Les Turner ALS Foundation. That is so amazing. So we're talking over $100,000 of impact towards a charity. Right. Last year, uh, being our 20th year, we kind of sat down and looked at the money we've raised. And so over the first 20 years, we've raised over $2 million at Highland Park High School for charities. Two million dollars. How does that make you feel graduating and knowing that you've had an impact on helping a charity? It's a really great feeling and especially knowing how involved I've become, how involved all of my friends and everyone has become. We really have something to be proud of. We've done a really great thing and it makes you feel really great. Awesome. Well, thank you both for coming on today. I'm glad to do it. Thank you for having us. Now it's time for our viewer's voice and today's question is, if you had the opportunity to change something big, what would it be? If I had the opportunity to change something big, it would be police brutality against African Americans. Well, at the moment, I feel like uh, lobbyists and big corporations put a lot of money into the government, and I feel like they kind of own it in a way where they can suggest laws that aren't beneficial to all of America. I would change everything for the kids, like schools, like our schools, basically schools and like daycares and all stuff like that, make it more safer and more secure. I would make it happen that everybody out of high school has to do a minimum four-year tour in the military because it sets you straight. It gets you in the lifestyle of being an adult, gets you out of your parents' house, gets you credit established, and it gets you trained on responsibility. I'd say people's perception on renewable energy. Student debt, so students are in such a deep hole after they graduate. Our next guest is making a huge impact across the board. Once an alcoholic, Bob Musikowski has turned his life around and is dedicated to helping others in Chicago. He founded several inner city little leagues, including one in near North Caprini Green housing projects. He is the president of the Hope Academy and also owns an alcohol and rehab facility. Welcome to the show, Bob. Happy to be here. Yeah, so in your life, you have made, would you say, a full circle, once an alcoholic, and then starting the little leagues in what some people would call the worst neighborhood. I would, I, it kind of worked out that way, but I don't know if I planned it that way, because uh, um, we moved by mistake as newlyweds next to Cabrini Green. I think a lot of people think I intended to 
And I just moved, I went running the next morning, and the cops put me in the car, and this was 1988, and said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm from New York, I just moved here. And they said, this is Cabrini Green. <laughs> so I, my wife and I had a little edge, so we stayed, and I started to have a catch with some of the boys. And we put out flyers hoping to get a little league team, and 300 boys came the first day. And what is, for the last 20 years, the biggest inner city little league in America was born. So when the 300 little boys showed up, at that time, did you realize that these kids are seeing a lot that maybe you didn't see when you grow up? Gun violence, drugs? You know, I grew up in Bayonne and Jersey City in the projects when it was mixed. So it was similar, but there were no guns. Like, the worst that could happen is you'd get beat up. Maybe somebody got stabbed, but the firepower today is, I was telling somebody as I came, I, I, we got shot at during football practice two weeks ago. So the firepower is what's different today, the gunfire. So how did you, when these little boys show up to play catch and you're teaching them about the fundamentals, how did you work them through maybe what they were seeing in their own life? Because you were able to give them a huge glimpse of hope of what their lives could be like. Well, yeah, and it had nothing to do with baseball. It was all about the connection, right? We're guys from the Board of Trade, where most of our coaches are from, from the financial markets, and doctors are now coaching these boys and girls that they'd never meet if it wasn't for sport. It just happened to be baseball. So, and baseball, there's a lot around about the vanishing black player, and people will think it's money or the fields, and it's, uh, I would, controversially, I, I would say it, it's a father-taught game. And when you have 20% of a population who aren't with their dad, they don't play that slow, patient game of baseball. They play other sports. So we're out there to teach. Baseball is just the carrot, but we're teaching about character building, showing up on time, doing what you said you were going to do, a lot of simple things. So how did you go from starting the Little League, investing in the boys in Caprini Green, or boys and girls, or just yeah. like boys and girls in Caprini Green, to now opening the Hope Academy? So. We just through our connections, and I think people don't need any gov more government programs. You need a connected neighbor. You need a friend to help you get a job, get a connection, and we're really great at that. And I've got a lot of boys scholarships to college over the years, and many flunked out coming out of CPS. So when our local Catholic school shut, we bought it. I just sold my business, and we bought Chicago. It was St. Callistus for 80 years, <sighs> and one of the 30 Catholic schools that are sitting there empty that have shut, tragically. And um, we purchased it, did about a $5 million rehab. So inside, it looks like Latin. It's nice. So your school, though, it's not going after the typical private school kid. It's, no. it's going after anybody. Yeah, we're, we're an independent school for poor kids. So What does that mean? Well, most independent schools, I ask everyone this question. Should independent or faith-based schools be only for rich kids? Everyone says no. Should they be racially segregated? No. Everybody says no. But in fact, pretty much the opposite is true, right? They're expensive, and they price out the poor kids, and they're pretty much all white, rich kids school. So we decided to do what, what I, I went, grew up in Catholic school system, nine years of nuns, four years of Marist Brothers in New Jersey, and um, try to do the parish school and fund it on our businesses. And everybody's paying a little bit. It's $10 a day minimum tuition, and everybody has that. That's controversial, too. Everybody has $10. They might not have it in their house, but their brother's a cop or they work in the cat. They have to do it in time or hours, in dollars or hours. So everybody pays a little bit. We have our businesses and then donations from people, friends, and family. And your whole, whole idea behind the school is to give every kid hope? Yes, and to give every kid a chance, right? And so it's not perfect. Everybody doesn't get it. We're 78% graduation rate from Fred. Our heartbreak of my life is when somebody has to be let go. And we don't cherry pick the best and brightest. We have kids, we, our ACT ranges from 16 to a 36, which is a perfect score. We had a perfect score. So we have the whole gamut. Because a lot of the high-end independent schools, they'll take some minority kids, but they're taking the kid, the high scorer, or the kid who can dunk. They're not taking the, the average kid who's trying really hard. So we sort of specialize in that kid. Based on your location or the different students you have from all different walks of life, has there, has there ever been a trying situation where one of your kids has gotten shot? Oh, or? sure, yeah. I, we had eight in one season in Little League. But um, I've, uh, we had a great uh, player. He left to go to Marshall and join a gang as junior. I begged him to stay. Came back out of jail about five years later. And um, he started to work for us. I was helping him with a GED. And we paid him on a Friday and was stabbed to death that late that afternoon. And I preached his funeral. Great player. And... So it doesn't always, Mother Teresa said, we're called to serve, not succeed. It doesn't always go smoothly. 
but we've had some mir miraculous things. So you're really making an impact. Anything you want to leave our viewers with? Yeah, you know, I'll leave you with this. I, I went to college with President Obama, and he came to our gym on election day the, a year ago for good luck. We got a call from the Secret Service, and he asked me, what's our secret? And I said, Barry, which is what we used to call him. <laughs> if you want to fix an inner city school, put your own kids in it. My kids go to Hope. Um, and there's a handful of us that the deal for our board was if you're going to be on this board, you have to put your own kids in the school. And I think that's the real difference. That's our quiddity, you know, that we have a small group of students who are, uh, who are there to be part, just to be part of it, you know. Our, so now we're probably, I would say, 70% African-American, the rest Latino and white. And it's a, it's a healthier mix. So um, anyway, a little out of the box school, Chicago Hope Academy. Today's show was a sample of how Be The Change can stand together and bring about positive results in our society through education, volunteering, and raising awareness. Our guests today have embraced their struggle and are dedicated to creating an impact. For more information on today's show or our guest, go to WhitneyReynolds.com. The Respiratory Health Association is a proud supporter of The Whitney Reynolds Show raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs.